the Borg Assimilator is being made into a playable ship in Star Trek Online, which shouldn't be that big of a surprise to anyone. It certainly wasn't to me, because I predicted that back in September. The stat blog has been released, so let's take a look at what this ship's going to be. Okay, I'm going to be doing this first impression video a little differently than I normally do. And by that, I mean I'm stealing the format Augie used in his video. I hope you don't mind, Augie, but I just cannot stand staring at the new Star Trek Online website because it's so bright. Thank God I wear sunglasses for these videos, because otherwise my corneas would have been burnt out months ago. Seriously, I feel like Slomek every time I open the site nowadays. It is too bright in here. Anyway, the Borg Assimilator. Let's get into the stats, because there are some things I want to talk about in here that are really bugging me. The first of which is the graphic that was featured in the blog. This states that the Borg Assimilator is original to Star Trek Online, which is not true. The Borg Assimilator is actually from an older Star Trek game called Star Trek Armada. They do state at the start of the blog that the ship is from Armada, but it's weird that the graphic here contradicts that. Especially because that's what more people are going to be looking at. Come on, Cryptic, you can do better than this. Oh, before I get to the stats, I should probably mention how this ship is going to be released. This is going to be introduced into the Infinity Lockboxes. It'll be going live on PC tomorrow, along with the Winter Event. That's going to be Tuesday, December 5th, but console will probably get this on a later date. The Borg Assimilator is going to be a Dreadnought Carrier, which I was initially very interested in. Though I'll explain my hangups about the ship once we get through the stats. The Assimilator has a hull modifier of 1.45 and a shield modifier of 1, so it's going to have pretty moderate shields, but rather high hull capacity. A 5-2 weapons layout, so this will be able to support a forward-facing build rather well. Three device slots. The bridge officer seating is going to be a Lieutenant Commander Tactical, a Commander Engineer slash Miracle Worker, a Lieutenant Commander Science slash Command, an Ensign Universal, and a Lieutenant Level Universal. Meaning this is going to be a full Miracle Worker ship with a secondary Lieutenant Commander Command ship. So because of that Miracle Worker seating, you can do an Energy Weapon build on this, and because that has a higher enough level at Command Seat, you could also do a Torpedo build on this thing. One of the biggest downsides to both Command and Miracle Worker is that neither of them have abilities that will trigger unconventional systems. However, this ship will have a good amount of science and universal seating to make up for that. The console layout is going to be 2 tactical, 5 engineering, 4 science, and 1 universal. This ship will be a really nice candidate for the advanced engineering isomag consoles. Counting that universal console slot, you'll have 6 of them, plus 2 more if you upgrade this thing to T6X2, totaling a potential of 8 isomags. However, this ship won't be that great for the vulnerability exploiters and locators from the Fleet Spire because you've only got the 2 tactical console slots. Even at T6X2, you're only going to get a maximum of 4 on there. And even then, you're probably going to lose one for the sake of making space for Lorca's custom fire control. With a base turn rate of 7, an impulse modifier of 0.15, and an inertia rating of 200, this thing is going to be very slow and feel very chunky to fly. Honestly, I'm hoping that 200 inertia rating is a typo or something, because that's just ridiculous. This thing is going to have zero drift at all. It'll just start, and then it'll just suddenly stop like it hit a brick wall. No hesitation at all. Assuming this isn't a typo, this will be the highest inertia rating on any ship by a huge margin. The previous one being the United Earth Defense Force vessel, which had an inertia rating of only 75. Even the liberated Borg Juggernaut only had an inertia of 65. So the 200 inertia that this thing has just seems beyond ridiculous. The power buffs for this thing will be plus 5 to weapons, plus 5 to shields, plus 15 to engines, and plus 15 to auxiliary. I guess the plus 15 is good, because with movement stats that low, this thing is going to be a very slow ship. And the Ox Power is going to help with any exotic abilities, like anything that deals radiation damage. Though I wish they put more of this power into the weapons. It will be able to equip dual cannons. Now, the ship details implies that this only has one hangar bay, which I was initially really annoyed about. But if you go down to the description of the new pets this thing has, that does confirm that this has two hangar bays. Yet another blog that is the victim of weird formatting decisions. The number of hangar bays should have been included with the ship details, not tucked away in the description of the new pets. Come on guys, it's been almost 14 years, we should know how to do a stats blog at this point. Being a full Miracle Worker ship, the Assimilator will have the cyclical quantum slipstream drive, and the innovation ship mechanic. And yet another typo here, the ship mastery package is labeled as the carrier mastery package. However, the actual stats on this thing are from the tactical carrier package. Which is the correct package for a dreadnought carrier, it's just weird that they mislabeled it to just the normal carrier one. Anyway, those mastery buffs will include hangar launch recharge speed, hull capacity, energy and kinetic damage, and shield capacity. The starship trait on the Assimilator is going to be called Targeted Excision, and it's a bit underwhelming because we already have a starship trait that's almost exactly like this. While this trait is slotted, activating beam overload or cannon rapid fire will activate the rank 1 versions of both of those abilities on your hangar pets. 
If that sounds familiar, that's because this trait is shockingly similar to Coordinated Assault off of the Alita Heavy Strike Wing Escort. Which, with that trait, if you activate Beam Overload or Rapid Fire, it will apply that ability to your hangar pets. The only difference is that Coordinated Assault will only apply one or the other. Whereas Targeted Excision will give both Beam Overload and Rapid Fire at the same time to your pets no matter which ability you use. So I guess you could say this is an ever so slight upgrade to an existing Starship trait. But it still only gives the Rank 1 versions of Beam Overload and Rapid Fire to your pets. Meaning this trait is going to be just as underwhelming as Coordinated Assault is. Now if it gave the Rank 3 versions of those abilities to your pets, then we'd be talking about something. But with just Rank 1, who cares? Especially since this is going to be a lockbox ship. That trait is certainly not worth a lockbox ship price. Now the console this thing comes with, that might be a different story. The console is called Disassemble and Analyze. It'll lock a tractor beam onto your target, holding it in place and dealing kinetic damage to it over time, while also giving you a stacking crit chance buff while it's active. This console can store up to 4 charges which will recharge every 30 seconds, meaning if you let this one sit for a little bit, you'll be able to use that tractor beam on multiple targets in rapid succession. However, if you use this ability on an assimilated ship, which is something that the hangar pets on this thing can do, it'll instead grant that crit chance bonus to all of your pets. That crit chance bonus to your pets will be permanent until you move maps, and can stack up to 86 times. So this sounds like it could be very nice for a pet build, because with this you'll be able to stack up massive amounts of crit chance for your pets. Just hangar pets, so this likely won't work with something like, say, the bottle sentry mode. But even so, this is still a very nice buff to have for your pets. Especially if you stack this with other pet buffs like Superior Air Denial, the Console of the Jerok, or the Console of the Friendship. Though I am curious if it will count assimilated ships from Retrofitted Assimilator as assimilated ships for this trait. I imagine they would, but honestly you never really know with Cryptic sometimes. Now onto the unique hangar pets that come with this ship, the Borg Assimilator Probes. I've seen some people complaining about the appearance of these, that they don't look like normal Borg probes. But I actually really like these, because they look like those assimilated structures that you see on the Defira Invasion Zone. So it kind of implies to me that this is not only used for assimilating ships, but also for assimilating planets. And the cone-like structure actually reminds me of the Borg Probe from Star Trek Armada. Anyway, these are frigate pets, meaning they're going to be quite a bit more resilient than your average hangar pet. But they're also quite a bit larger, meaning you're only going to be able to launch two of these per hangar bay on like, you know, the six that you can get from a normal fighter. When defeating an enemy, these pets are capable of drilling into an enemy's hull, preventing a warp core breach, and instead assimilating the vessel. Advanced and Elite versions will be obtainable through the Dilithium Store and the Fleet Star Base respectively, just like most other hangar pets. And assimilating a foe grants an increasing base damage buff. Base damage means Cat 1, but that damage buff will scale based on the size of that assimilated target. So if that probe assimilates a frigate, it will gain a 25% buff to its Cat 1 damage. But if it assimilates a Dreadnought, it becomes 100%. Meaning cruisers will probably give 50% and battle cruisers will probably give 75%. Now one thing I am a bit worried about is that I'm really hoping that Cryptic doesn't bind these frigate pets to the Assimilator or any other Borg ships. Because while they've loosened up on the restrictions on Universal consoles over the years, they're still pretty picky about what ships can use what hangar pets. And I'm a little worried that they're going to make these pets only usable on Borg ships. Which would suck for two reasons, one being that this is the only Borg ship with a hangar bay, and the other being that the console really seems to be designed to work in tandem with these pets. Yeah, the console can give you some crit chance, but its real power seems to be that it's capable of buffing your hangar pets. But you need to be able to assimilate targets to buff your pets with the console. And like I said earlier, there's no guarantee that it will consider the ships from the retrofitted assimilator as assimilated ships. And even then, retrofitted assimilator can only assimilate one ship at a time and has a 2 minute cooldown, so using that as an alternative is going to be much slower. So overall, it's not a bad ship, there are far worse ships to pick from in the Infinity lockboxes. But it's just a number of weird things about it that I'm just like, eh, about. Like the 5-2 layout is nice, the bridge officer seating is pretty decent, I imagine a lot of people are going to be upset about the lack of tactical consoles. The inertia rating is bonkers to me though, and I'm still hoping that that's a typo. The copy pasting of the Starship trait was better than the copy pasting from the actual blog itself, which is not a compliment. The console and the pets do sound really good in tandem together, but at the same time I am still worried that one or possibly even both will end up being restricted to either this ship or just Borg ships in general. Which is a problem because we've only got the two, assuming you count the liberated Borg juggernaut, and that one doesn't have a hangar bay. Now there's one last thing I want to talk about, and that has to do with some weird inconsistencies with Dreadnought carriers. Now every type of ship in Star Trek has its own defining features. Dreadnoughts are cruisers with a hangar bay and sometimes with a spinal lance. 
Warships are always escorts, but they trade the experimental weapon slot that escorts normally have for an eighth normal weapon slot. Spearhead science vessels are normal science vessels with an extra weapon slot in the front. But what are the characteristics of a dreadnought carrier? One of them is that dreadnought carriers always have two hangar bays, and the other is that they always have a commander level tactical seat. Or at least they used to. This list, which I found on the Stow Wiki, lists every dreadnought carrier currently in the game, except for the assimilator, which won't be out till tomorrow. But you can see in the buff seating tab that nearly every single one of them has a commander level tactical seat. The only exception is the Herc Vecrid Hive Dreadnought Carrier. I remember when the Vecrid came out, I never understood why they made this normally tactical focused ship class into an engineering class. Because if you look at all the previous examples of Dreadnought Carriers, they are all tactical focused. The Sarcophagus, the Zentar, the Zindi Aquatic Ship. But then the Vecrid came out with a commander level engineering seat. And now this is apparently becoming a pattern because they're doing it again with the Borg Assimilator. What is the point of having two engineering-focused carrier classes? Because we already have flight deck carriers, which are basically cruisers with two hangar bays, which in exchange for that, they lose some of the command auras. But a dreadnought carrier only has seven weapon slots, much like an escort normally has. So why is its tactical seating lieutenant commander and engineering seating commander when it only has the seven weapon slots? It just, it makes no sense to me, and I'm worried that in designing the Assimilator, they didn't go far back enough and look at other examples of other Dreadnought carriers beyond the Vecrid. Because the Vecrid is an outlier and is atypical of most Dreadnought carriers. But if this is going to be the state of Dreadnought carriers from now on, having seven weapon slots, two hangar bays, and a commander level engineering seat, instead of the commander level tactical seat, then I would start to suspect that they are nerfing Dreadnought carriers, intentionally or not. Because we all know, engineering seating does not compare to tactical seating. So yeah, that is the Borg Assimilator Dreadnought Carrier. Like I said in the video, I'm, I've got mixed feelings about it, most of which have to do with the weird inconsistencies with Dreadnought Carriers. They used to always be tactical ships, but now sometimes they're engineering ships. The, it makes no sense to me, and I really wish Cryptic would, you know, kind of acknowledge this and try to figure out which one is which. Be sure to let me know what you think of the Borg Assimilator in the comments down below, and while you're down there, be sure to like and subscribe and hit that bell for notifications. If you'd like to further support the channel, you can hit the join button to become a member, or hit the super thanks button, or find the link to the merch store in the video's description. If you're ever shopping on the Epic Game Store, be sure to use my content creator code STU1701. It doesn't cost you anything extra, but it does help me out, and I do appreciate that. That is content creator code STU1701. Either way, though, thank you so much for watching. My name's Stu, and I will see you guys next time.